Okay, <laughs> let's get into it. I don't even know what to say. I've got so much more energy this time around. It's actually really weird. Last time I was like, hello, today we're going to be talking about, but now I've recovered from COVID and I'm feeling so much better. So I feel like I can deliver a proper video today in the style that I want to. So hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Ellis. I have hair like a Yorkshire Terrier today, but that's fine. That's intentional. We're going with it. This is my second video. Uh, wow, you can totally see me in the background. Sexy. This is my second true crime video that I have done on my channel. I am planning to do one a week, once every weekend. My last one was on Friday. This one I think will be going up on Sunday. So consistent. So I suppose I just want to start by saying like a massive thank you to everyone who watched my first video. It got way more views than I thought, honestly. I thought I was going to end up with like nine subscribers and like two views and one of them was me, but it actually did a lot better than I thought. So thank you so much. I do apologise for the very monotonous reading off a script vibe it was given, but I was, oh, I was choked, honestly. I was so, so choked. And I just had my heart set on making the video. So I just wanted to get it out regardless of being ill, which is stupid. I should have just rested, but it's done now. It's done. In other news, I adopted a new cat this week. His name is Ziggy. And I'm really hoping he makes an appearance in this video just because I want to show you him. He's so cute. I initially said that his name was going to be Joe. If you've seen that on TikTok, he's not a Joe. We kind of like collaboratively agreed that Joe was just not his name. It just didn't suit him. It wasn't for him. So we changed it and Ziggy just suits him so much better. So we're winning. I really need to shut that wardrobe door because it's seriously bothering me. Right, let's do this. So this case is a case that I've been very aware of for a very long time. It is one I have watched films about, watched documentaries about, read about, done a lot of research on. Um, one that really like affected me when I was looking into it. I don't know whether it's because it's just a young girl can obviously resonate with that. It's just such a it's, a, it's a peculiar case in the sense that, well, we'll get into it. I don't want to tell you right now because that's literally at the end of my, my notes. But yeah, like I said, it's definitely a case that lots of people will be familiar with. Um, I'd be quite surprised if you haven't heard of it, but if you haven't, that is okay. That's why I'm here. So let's just get into it now. Thank you very much again for coming onto my channel and being interested in the videos I'm making. It means a lot to me. And if you like this video, please subscribe. And what else do you do on this? Oh yeah, like for more. <laughs> So this is the case of Natasha Campus. Now, Natasha was a young girl who was abducted on her way to school when she was just 10 years old and she was actually held captive for eight and a half years before she escaped. She was born on the 17th of February, 1988 in Vienna, Austria to her parents, Brigitta and Ludwig. Brigitta and Ludwig had quite a turbulent relationship anyway. They didn't really get on. Ludwig was said to be something of an alcoholic, uh, which caused a lot of tension, a lot of friction between him and Natasha's mum. And so they had separated, not officially, they weren't officially divorced, but they had separated when Natasha was very, very young. Now, because they had separated, this meant that Natasha spent some of her time at her dad's house and some of her time at her mum's house. So it was split parenting and that's just how it worked for them. It was, unfortunately, one of those situations, though, where Brigitta, Natasha's mum, had a lot of... Um, under the surface anger still for Ludwig for the father and because she never saw him anymore because they were separated the only time they were within each other's company was to hand Natasha over back and forth to stay for the week or the weekend all of that anger that she had pented up inside for Natasha's father was often taken out on Natasha and I wouldn't go as far as to say from what I've read from the research I've done that this was an abusive relationship between mother and daughter absolutely not but they definitely certainly fought a lot Brigitte was known to slap Natasha on occasion. They were known to argue a lot. They would get into quite heated situations on many occasions, usually when she had just come back from her father's house. And again, I think this was just Brigitte not having access to Natasha's father to take that actual anger out where it was supposed to be directed. So instead, she just intentionally or unintentionally took it out on Natasha. So the day before Natasha was abducted, she returned back to her mother's care after a holiday with her father in Hungary. So as normal, as she had been away with her father, an argument started between Brigitte and her daughter Natasha, as it always did. Brigitte didn't like that Ludwig always took his daughter out to the pub. He absolutely loved a drink and he always took Natasha out later than she should be out and he was usually late dropping her off, late getting her to bed when she had school the next day, things like that. It was quite a routine and honestly I can't blame Brigitte for being annoyed at that. Do I think it's right for her to take that out on Natasha? Absolutely not but I can understand where she's coming from as as a mother. I'm not a mother but as a mother for her it must be infuriating, it must be frustrating. So like I said it was the day after Natasha returned from that holiday with her dad, it was the 2nd of March 1998 when she got up for school. Tensions had been high since she got home, her and her mum had argued non-stop. I think it's also really worth mentioning um, when talking about Brigitte's kind of character, she was somebody who 
was very big on rules and precautions. She was quite a a cautious person. She always kind of had, it, not paranoia, I wouldn't go that far, but she was always thinking of possible worst case scenarios in her head and she was very, very strict when it came to Natasha about Natasha not being allowed to go anywhere by herself, never to talk to strangers. Of course, you should teach your kids all of this, but this was like, seriously drummed into Natasha, like a little bit more than it should have been. So much so that Natasha was 10 years old at this point. She had never walked to school by herself and the school wasn't too far away. It was maybe about a 20 minute walk for her at most. She knew where she was going. She was one of the few kids left whose mum still dropped them off at the gate and for that she was quite severely picked on by the other kids. The other kids tended to pick on Natasha a little bit anyway because of her weight. She was, <laughs> there he is, look who's joining us. <laughs> Video. So Natasha was quite picked on because of her weight anyway. She was a little bit of a chubby child. Her mum used to be known to say to her, you should stop eating so many biscuits. Her mum did make like a little bit of like a dig at her about her weight at times. Um, I'm sure she just wanted the best for her daughter, but it did in turn make Natasha very self-conscious, even from a very young age. So on this first day back after a holiday, it had been agreed before she left that this would be the first time that Natasha would be allowed to walk to school by herself. So if I'm doing my research right, the bulk of the argument was that morning. So the night before they had been arguing, but it had been civil enough to make the decision that Natasha was going to go to school by herself for the first time. And Natasha didn't like her uniform, she said it made her look fat and her mum kind of said well maybe if you stopped eating so many biscuits that wouldn't be the case and that's how it all kicked off that morning again. Now Natasha and her mum obviously having all these sort of rules and precautions anyway, one of the other things that her mum always drummed into her was never leave anywhere, never leave each other, never go anywhere without saying I love you goodbye. Another thing that's fair enough and probably practiced in many many families but on this morning because they'd had the argument and Natasha felt this is this is the morning I'm going to be grown up, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to walk to school by myself. She was quite excited to do it, she was quite excited for once just to feel like an adult. Just to spite her mother that morning she left without saying goodbye or I love you or anything like that. She just left and her mum recalls looking out of the window and watching her daughter cross the courtyard in a state of upset and confusion that her daughter hadn't said bye to her. Now some sources report that Natasha had been so upset by the arguments with her mum and just the separation in general between her parents and the constant back and forth, her dad bickering about her mum, her mum bickering about her dad, that that morning when she was walking to school she actually contemplated jumping out in front of a car but she talked herself out of it. She just, she wasn't ever really going to do it. I, I would hope she was only 10. Um, but it is a thought that she later mentioned crossed her mind that morning. So yeah, her mum saw her head off to school. Natasha walked to school by herself and that was the last she was heard from. She never made it to school that day and her mum waited on her for 10 minutes past the time that she was due to be home that evening. Bear in mind, Natasha was never late. So after 10 minutes, her mum was already thinking, this is really weird, but she gave her a further 20. So she waited half an hour in total and when Natasha still hadn't showed up, that is when she got in touch with the police. Police initially launched an investigation and this is when a 12 year old girl who attended Natasha's school came forward and said that she had seen Natasha on the other side of the road that morning. Natasha had been seen walking past a white van after which two men jumped out, grabbed her and bundled her into the back of the van. Now I just want to put it out there now that nobody else ever reported anything about a second man in this situation. Natasha herself later on said there was never a second man, it was always just one. So at this point, this is what the police had to go on. They thought they had two men that they were looking for and a white van. So what they did is they went door to door around Vienna searching for everybody who was listed to own a white van. They covered 771 addresses in total. Sorry if my position's changed, I just had to go and give my brand new cat eardrops. So he now hates me after like four days of building trust and it's broken my heart, but he's got ear mites. Anyway, so one of the doors that the police knocked on was that of a man called Varfgang Pricklepil. Now, I have watched loads of videos and every British and American person pronounces it Wolfgang, but I do believe the German pronunciation of this name is Varfgang, so that is how I'm going to say it. I'm so sorry if it's wrong. Varfgang came out of his house, which was actually registered in his mother's name, and said that the van is just used for construction work. He works on construction sites from time to time. It's empty, apart from a little bit of rubble. Would they like to look inside? And the police say, nah. We'll just take your word for it, that's fine. Cross them off a list, job done. But had they carried out an investigation of this man properly, 
they could have saved a little girl eight and a half years of her life being taken away from her because it was indeed Varfgang Priklopil that had seen Natasha walk into school that morning and snatched her into his white minivan. So let's go back and start this morning again and do it from Natasha's side, go through the whole abduction, everything. So she left home, she didn't say goodbye to her mum but she had convinced her mum that she could walk to school by herself. It was a busy route, wasn't too far, all the kids were walking in this, you know what it's like with primary schools, all the kids just flood in a one -er. Even like people that are walking by themselves are still walking with people. It was very busy. There's parents usually dotted about anyway for the younger kids. Natasha was just buzzing to be able to go by herself. She really truly felt so grown up. She felt so brave. She felt so big. And she was just really happy with just this tiny little luxury being able to go somewhere by herself. As she was walking up a street, she saw a man just ahead of her at the pavement stood beside his white minivan and he looked really, really odd. And this is a 10 year old girl picking up on this, picking up on the fact that he looked odd. So how much does that tell you about how odd he was? Natasha's mum had always told her, if you see something strange or you see somebody weird walking towards you, you see anything, you have any sort of sense of imminent danger, cross the street or turn and walk the other way or just go somewhere and try and avoid it as best you can. And that little voice was in the back of Natasha's head and she very, very nearly did cross the street, but she didn't. She wanted to be big and brave and grown up and independent. So she said to herself internally, no, Natasha, walk past this man. It'll be fine. Just keep walking to school. And unfortunately, it would normally be the case that Natasha would have been completely fine. It was genuinely just her bad luck um, that somebody who was brought up to take such precaution when going anywhere was abducted the first time they went somewhere by themselves. So as she walked closer and closer to the van, just as she was about to start to pass it, this man, who we know now as Varfgang Priklopil, turned and started walking towards her. He grabbed her, put his hand round over her mouth and spun her round. She, she said she couldn't even scream. She couldn't even scream because she was so shocked that this was actually happening to her. Natasha obviously was a very cautious little girl. She was well versed in following the news and keeping up with anything any time that this happened so she was completely shocked she did she said she doesn't remember making a sound so he grabbed her turned around and just threw her into the back of his minivan and drove away and Natasha remembers that when she was in the back of this van she could see out a tiny little part of the top section of the window I think Varfgang had very much tried to cover it so that nobody could see in and she certainly couldn't see out but he had left a little bit I suppose and she could see an, a higher portion of what you would be able to see out of the window so she could see the tops of trees and lampposts and things like that but she says that she kind of knew where she was based on the way that the van was turning and it never really went far and that's the thing about that is arguably one of the more frustrating elements of this case is that Natasha Campush was held hostage for almost 10 years and she wasn't even that far away from home. So Varfgang Priklopil was 35 years old and he lived in his mother's house on the outskirts of Vienna. As we know, the police had already come to search his house when they found out that he was the owner of a white van and that is, they were checking any vehicle matching that description. But after those searches had actually taken place, the police received another tip about Varfgang. It was a completely independent tip and a neighbour just phoned and said, look, this guy is a bit strange. He has got security cameras all around his property. He is very rarely out and about. His blinds are always closed. He never speaks to anybody. Now, obviously being a bit of a loner isn't some reason that you would normally call the police on somebody, but I think in light of the fact that a little girl had been abducted, this neighbor thought this might be worth a shot because this guy's a total weirdo. So Natasha at least had some sort of vague idea of where she was, right? She knew she wasn't far. She couldn't exactly completely pinpoint it. It wouldn't matter anyway because there was nothing she could do, but she knew that she was relatively within the same area. She hadn't gone far. So when Varfgang drove into his property, he closed the big gate behind him and opened the door. And Natasha was sat there really, really quietly, obviously absolutely terrified. And this is when he picked her up and brought her into his garage. So he didn't park the van in the garage. The van was in the driveway and in front of that was a garage. So he took her in there and within the garage, there was a sort of trap door almost situation going on with steps going down into a sort of basement slash cellar. It was basically a big storage room and it had loads of things you would just expect to be in it like cabinets and just bits of rubble and a safe even. There was a safe in this room and it was sitting flush against the wall under cabinets just completely just it looked so 
I wouldn't think anything of it looking at it. Let's just put it that way. However, as we would later find out, you could remove this massive, big, heavy safe away from its place against the wall. And behind that, you would find a half metre wide hole in the wall. Anybody who wished to gain access to this hole would have to turn around and sort of lower themselves through it backwards, if that makes sense. It was very, very small and very, very tight and there was just a certain knack to do it. If you went in front ways, I suppose you could, cr it just wouldn't be me. Once you had lowered yourself backwards into this hole, you found yourself in a sort of little concrete, not a room, but just, it was almost just like a little space and from there there was only one way to go and that was through this gigantic door that was reinforced with concrete and steel that led into the dungeon in which Natasha would be kept for the next eight and a half years. This room was soundproof, it was obviously not only under the house but it was also under the basement and the cellar, whatever you want to call it, it was like two stories under. There was no windows, there was no ventilation, it was absolutely intended to put something or someone that was never meant to be found. It was completely pre-thought out. The room was completely soundproof and it was obvious that Prick Lapel had built it because he built it himself. The house didn't come with this dungeon as part of the deal. He had completely spent years planning this all out, mapping it all out and building it himself. So not only is this crime completely messed up, it is also very, very premeditated with more than enough time for him to have decided, actually, do you know what? I'm not going to do this, but he went ahead and did it anyway. This took years of planning, preparation and execution of making this little chamber. So the room was tiny. It was five metres squared and it had nothing in it initially. It had like a five centimetre thick mattress on the floor. That was it. Varfgang left Natasha with only the clothes on her back. This was after taking away her shoes and her school backpack and burning them, completely destroying them because he had this weird sense of paranoia that she had something within the backpack or within the shoes even that was traceable, was trackable. So obviously this room was very poorly ventilated. There would be no natural air really getting to it. So when Varfgang had built it, he had installed ventilation into the room and this ventilation went right up to the roof. So even if Natasha was to shout through the vents, nobody would hear her because there, there was nobody up there and it was kind of blocked by this really irritating noise that the vent was making and Natasha had to listen to that for years. That is just, that would make you go mental. On top of this, there was also a sink in the room and that dripped constantly, just continuously dripped. So as a result of the dodgy vent and the leaking sink, the conditions in this room with somebody living in it, breathing in it, just existing in it, became very bad very quickly and a lot of mould grew in this room. And this also came with bugs that would infest the room. It was not a nice place for anyone to be, let alone a little girl who was growing. It took up to an hour for Varfgang to get from his house down into Natasha's little dungeon. An hour. That is mental to get to like a floor of your house. Natasha said this was kind of good for her because she could hear him as he started making his way down from the moment he moved the safe and she knew from then she still had a good long while till he got there so she could at least prepare herself. He was never just bursting in and surprising her so that was good in a way but Varfgang really really quickly grew tired of it so what he did was he installed an intercom one in the little dungeon and one up in his house and that is how he communicated with Natasha for the majority of the time. As well as this, because there was no windows, Varfgang actually installed lights that initially were left on 24-7. So Natasha never knew what time of day it was. She was getting really, really rubbish sleep as you would if you were constantly in artificial light. It would keep you awake. She just said she was sleeping so, so badly, if at all. So Varfgang's next little venture that he installed in Natasha's room was a light that was on a timer. So every day it would come on at the same time and every night it would go off at the same time. But this made Natasha Natasha feel like she was genuinely just in a prison. I know in effect she was in some sort of prison but she just didn't like this at all. It was like as soon as the lights went out she was like right that's it then I guess I have no choice but to go to sleep. No windows, no nothing. It's going to be pitch black. You wouldn't be able to do anything. I think the real interesting element of this case is exploring the relationship between Varfgang and Natasha throughout these full eight years. Varfgang was very hot and cold so he would buy her things for her room to make her more comfortable. He bought her books, he bought her, you know, kind of like maths books, books to read, stuff to kind of still continue to learn with. She was only supposed to be in primary school. 
He bought her a toothbrush, he bought her a hairbrush, he let her listen to pre-recorded media, he wouldn't let her listen to anything on the radio that was current obviously because he didn't want her to know that anybody was looking for her, he wanted her to feel like she had been completely forgotten about by the outside world. But of course that wasn't the case, Natasha had not been forgotten by the outside world at all, at least of all her parents. So some days Wolfgang was buying her these things that would help her and support her and make her just feel a little bit better about being there and he would sometimes bring her down nice nutritious home-cooked meals that would often be cooked by his mum who had no idea that she was down there. However, Varfgang Bricklapil had intense mood swings so just as much as he could have a good day and be as nice as he possibly could to Natasha given that he was her captor, he would also have really bad days and these would be the days that he would starve her, he would beat her, he would mentally torture her. He was always very obviously paranoid that Natasha was conspiring against him even though this was a 10 year old girl that he had taken off the street. All she wanted was to go back to her mum and he was, he was obviously just mental. He was obviously just insane. He thought that she was completely trying to get one over on him all the time but she was absolutely like shit scared of him. At the end of the day what it really came down to was Wolfgang being very very angry whenever he felt like he was losing control. Control is the number one component of this whole case. This is what this whole thing that Wolfgang did was based on. So much so that one of the things he drilled into Natasha from the day she got there was obey me. And he would say this to her when he was with her, obey me, just on loop, obey me, obey me. He would do it through the intercom as well. And that is pretty much how life continued for Natasha for the next few years. And the stage of her life I'm going to talk about next is when she was in her early teens. So this is a few years later and there was one day where she actually started her period when she was in the dungeon, obviously she hadn't been anywhere else. She started her period and I'm not entirely sure if she even would have known what that was because she was only 10 when she said goodbye to the outside world. World. So whether she'd had that level of sex education or not, even education about puberty, I don't know. But one day she woke up and she started her period. So she asked Wolfgang the next time he was in the dungeon with her, she begged him, could I please go upstairs and have a shower? I need a shower. Wolfgang, a man who was adamant that Natasha would never really see the light of day again, actually eventually agreed to this and he took her up to the house. But before doing so, he closed all the curtains closed all the blinds, locked all the doors and the entire time had Natasha grabbed around the arm. Now Natasha when she was abducted she was what you would consider and what she considered to be an overweight child but by this point after you know three four five years of starving already she was literally tiny. She was so emaciated she was skin and bone so if he had grabbed the top of her arm he could pretty much wrap his hand the entire way around it because she was just so malnourished. When he took her up for a shower, Wolfgang made Natasha wear a bag over her head so none of her hair would fall anywhere and he made her wear gloves so she couldn't get fingerprints anywhere, even though when she was wearing the gloves he still rigorously wiped the surfaces that she had touched. He was so, so scared of getting her DNA anywhere in that house that he was like incredibly paranoid about everything. So Natasha had her shower and from this it obviously proved to Wolfgang that Natasha could to a degree be trusted to be up in the house. She didn't try to run away, she didn't disobey him, she didn't leave his side, she genuinely just wanted a shower. So from this Natasha was gradually granted more and more freedom from her dungeon. She was allowed up completely supervised to clean the house from time to time. It was never anything for her benefit, it was all for Wolfgang's benefit but she was allowed up to cook for him and clean the house and as long as she was still being careful at this point she had to clean up after herself if she touched anything. As long as she was being careful he knew at this point that he had that much control over her and she was that scared of him and they had such a strange toxic relationship where they almost got on one day and the other day he was completely abusive to her. He had her completely wrapped around his finger. He just knew she would not try anything with him. Yeah, so his treatment of her continued to be very up and down while they were both in the house. Some days he would let her sit at the table with him and eat dinner with him and other days he would show her the food after her not having eaten for three or four days. She was starving. He would show her the food that he was going to eat for his dinner and he wouldn't let her touch it. It was things like that. It was total mind games, total power trip. One day Natasha asked if she could write a letter to her parents and just let them know that she was getting on okay. She actually put a code integrated into this letter that only they would be able to understand and despite Wolfgang proofreading anything she ever wanted to send anywhere he did not crack he did not ever notice that there was a code in this letter 
and he took it from her and he said okay I'm going to post it but your parents don't care about you they don't care nobody's asked for you you're not in the news you're not anywhere nobody cares nobody's even noticed you're missing but okay I'll post it for you now of course you and I know that Natasha was a worldwide name she was global news she was headline news and her parents continued to look for her every day until the day that she actually came home to them so Varfgang took the letter from Natasha, he pretended to proofread it, he didn't notice there was any sort of code or hidden little message in it and he said right I'll go and post it for you. Of course he didn't, he just destroyed it but Natasha believed that what had happened is he had posted the letter to her parents but that they didn't reply, they didn't care so he received no reply. That's what he said to her, he just said they've never written back they aren't looking for you, they just don't care that you're here, nobody misses you. Meanwhile, this was absolutely not the case at all and Natasha's mum in particular never gave up hope looking for her daughter, even though the investigation was really amounting to nothing, they just couldn't find any leads, they had no idea what happened to Natasha Kampusch at all. So while Varfgang was telling Natasha that her mum didn't even care that she was missing, Natasha's mum was making her a birthday cake every year on her birthday. Her mum was distraught that her daughter was missing, especially with the way they had left things. Her mum was absolutely devastated that this had happened to her of all people who aired caution at all times. Like, how could this have happened to her and her daughter? She had told Natasha from such a young age about the dangers in the world and how to avoid them, yet still, this had happened to her and her family. As the investigation was amounting to absolutely nothing, Natasha's mum was actually advised to buy a plot of land so that her daughter could be buried whenever she was found. And what a horrible thing to say to her. Like, there is every chance that she could have been murdered. It happens way too often, but in this case, when we know that when we know that Natasha comes home safe to her mum, for the police to have told her to buy a plot of land, it just is so callous, like it's so inhuman. I really didn't like that when I was reading about that at all. So back in Varfgang's house, Natasha was remaining in limbo. She was allowed up sometimes. She spent most of the time in the basement still in her little cellar dungeon room, but she was still allowed up and down for little short supervised periods of time and that was it. On one occasion, Varfgang actually let her into the garden. This was in the dead of night. It was for the space of less than, I think, five minutes and he held her the whole time and he said, if you scream, I will kill you. Like, she was constantly getting this barrage of threats. If you do this, if you try this, I'll do this. But just imagine, like, this was her first time outside in, like, at this point, six years, I think it was, five or six years. She had been in this tiny little five metre room, occasionally up and down to the main house. She had not been outside and felt grass on her feet in years. She had not seen the sky in years. She had not felt air on her body in years or heard the noises of like crickets chirping. That is the thing she said that she specifically remembers was the crickets. So after seeing that he had been able to take her out into the garden, Varfgang kind of took a step back from the situation and looked at her and compared what she looked like now to how she looked when she left. Now people... Natasha's pictures had been all over the news so people really, as much as everyone was aware she would have grown up a little bit by now, everyone just had this image of this short young girl with the full fringe and the sort of bob haircut, that was the image that was in their mind and because she had grown up she had lost so much weight, Varfgang was actually shaving her head at this point to completely bald so that she didn't get any hair anywhere he looked at her and he was like nobody would even recognize you right now if I just paraded you down the street. So from there Natasha's role of carrying out tasks for Varfgang extended to coming with him out to do the shopping. Now again and I know I keep coming back to making the same point but doesn't that just say so much about how controlling this man was? I have held you captive in my house for all these years and I know I can take you down to the local supermarket and nobody will even know who you are. Like that is just so messed up. He just was so confident in himself. Natasha would later report that she tried to gesture to people with her eyes but she thought that because of how emaciated she was and how her head had been shaved that people genuinely just thought she was maybe giving them strange looks because she wasn't quite right. That's her own words. She thought that it it was quite obvious to her that people were looking at her thinking there was something wrong with her and that she was just making faces rather than actually trying to actively like look for somebody to help her. For example, there was one day where she and Varfgang were stopped in a police check, just a random police check, and she was trying to gesture to the police officer with her eyes and he didn't even bat an eyelid. She's convinced that he thought that she definitely had something a little bit wrong with her and that's just so sad that she had that, not opportunity, but she was a girl in a situation where she had been abducted, held captive for all these years. She was literally like that far away from a police officer and she still wasn't able to evade her captor. Like it's, 
it's really really such a complicated situation she's in and I really really like feel for her that must have been the most scary confusing like helpless feeling she must have honestly thought after that I'm never getting away from this man like if if I can't get away now how am I ever ever going to be able to do it however on the 23rd of August 2006 when Natasha Campush was 18 years old she managed to escape from Varfgang Priklopil. The two of them were outside in the driveway in broad daylight and Varfgang asked Natasha to hoover his car because he was trying to sell it. Natasha was outside hoovering the vehicle when the potential buyer of the car phoned Varfgang and he couldn't hear the buyer on the phone because of the sound of the hoover so he moved away further inside and took his eyes off Natasha. He didn't think he had to worry at this point but he was completely gone. He was away from the noise so he could talk on the phone. And this is when Natasha, who had all but given up hope at this point for ever escaping, looked up and saw that the gate to the driveway was unlocked and slightly open. And she just bolted. She just, she dropped the hoover, left it on so that it wouldn't sound like it had just suddenly turned off and attract Varfgang's attention. She dropped the hoover and ran. And she says she ran and ran and ran and didn't look back, didn't think, didn't even have any comprehension of where she was going. She just went for it. Now, the first thing that I am going to tell you what happened after that is that Varfgang finished his phone call. He came outside onto his driveway. He noticed that the Hoover was running. Natasha was not there and he looked down his driveway and saw his gate open. In that instant, he knew what he was going to do and he didn't even give it any thought. He got straight into his car. He drove to the train station and he went down, he walked down to the tracks and he lay down with his head on the train tracks and was hit by an oncoming train. And that was the end of Varfgang Priklopil. He was obviously killed. You don't survive something like that, of course. Um, he just knew, obviously, that when she got out, there was no way he would ever be able to escape justice for what he had done. He just accepted that he had put this girl through almost 10 years of torture, abuse, taken away her whole teenage years essentially just for his own selfish needs so he knew there was no way he was ever going to evade taking responsibility for that so he just did the cowardly thing in this situation and took himself to the train tracks he didn't want to accept punishment for what he did i just want to really clear that up that i don't think suicide is a cowardly thing to do i just think when you are doing it in this context to evade taking responsibility for what you've done to somebody else in particular coward's way out. He should have received everything that was coming to him for what he did to Natasha. So as Natasha ran out of the driveway she kept running and running until she came to the garden slash allotment of this lady. Now this woman was quite taken aback. There was just this really skinny, emaciated, terrified looking girl desperately begging with her to call the police. She was like, I'm Natasha Campush, I'm Natasha Campush, I'm here, I'm alive, please phone the police. And so this woman was just like so confused, but she was like, okay, like, I'll phone the police. The police showed up and they were absolutely gobsmacked. They were in complete disbelief. And so Natasha was reunited with her family. She was reunited with the world, I suppose. Everybody wanted to know what had happened to her. She was completely bombarded by the media, which, you know, it happens a lot in these cases. But, you know, in a situation like this, of course, you would think that everybody would kind of leave her alone and let her adapt to new life but as we know the the media aren't quite like that um they were desperately digging at natasha to give them a headline plot point to to tell them something that tell them something that they deemed bad enough to put on the front of their newspapers and natasha just she had just got out of eight and a half years of captivity she wasn't wanting to do interviews she wasn't wanting to, she wasn't ready to tell her full story um, so she was getting really badly harassed by the media. It sounds really sick, but they really just wanted a story that was grisly enough that they could get like a huge big headline from it. And it almost got to the point where Natasha would say something that happened to her and for the people that were pushing her, the press and everything like that, they were like, that doesn't sound that bad. That's not bad enough. We want to hear something worse than that that happened to you sort of thing. Aside from this, there was also huge media outrage about the fact that the police had been in contact with Varfgang Priklopil twice. So the first time when they checked his house because of the white van and the second time when they had been tipped by a neighbour that he was a strange individual. If the police had conducted a search properly that day that they showed up to look at his van and check out what was going on, this could have been avoided. Now, I am under the impression that even if the police had gone into that house to just do an initial look around, they would never 
have known to pull out that safe and they would never have thought that there was a whole room behind it. There's no way. Now we're kind of coming to the end of this now, but this part is the part of this case that a lot of people have difficulty with understanding and it is to do with something called Stockholm Syndrome. Now Stockholm Syndrome is typically described as feelings of trust or affection that a victim has for their captor in situations like Natasha's. When Natasha found out that Varfgang had taken himself down to the train tracks and killed himself, she was upset. There are some reports that say that she burst into tears. This isn't the case. She did not cry. Um, but she was upset and she maintained the opinion that he didn't need to die. He shouldn't have had to die and that she didn't really want that for him. She didn't want that to have happened. Natasha has since said that she acknowledges that Varfgang was a huge part of her life and nothing will ever change that ever. So she went missing when she was 10. She was found again when she was 18. So almost half of her life was spent with this man. And there were some days where he was really nice to her. You can take from that what you will. Maybe some people would say that he was never actually nice to her. It was all grooming or it was all for his own benefit. And I completely understand that. But from her point of view, this is the only man, the only human being, the only anything that she saw for eight and a half years of her life. And there were some days where she felt like he was nice to her and that he cared about her. And they would talk about a future together, which of course she had no option in because she didn't ever see herself getting out. Another controversial thing that Natasha has done since escaping captivity is actually buy Varfgang's house. She bought the house where she was held for all those years. Natasha said she had two reasons for buying this house. Number one was that she knew if she didn't buy it that somebody else would buy it themselves and turn it into some sort of museum. They would probably turn it into some sort of tourist attraction where they would charge people to come in and look at the dungeon where Natasha Kampusch was kept for eight and a half years. That's totally what would have happened as well. I don't think she was off the mark with that one at all. That definitely would have happened. So that was the first reason she bought it. But the second reason she bought it is because she wanted to be able to be in that property, in the garden, in the home, even in the dungeon, and know that she had full control. So to buy a space that you were held in against your will and face it head on was her way, I think, of getting closure for that. Of saying, I don't need to be scared of this house. I don't need to be scared of what happened here. Here I am taking back control of the situation. I now own this house. I decide who comes and goes. I decide when I come and go. It's all in the past and this is the new beginning. And I completely get that. She doesn't live there full time. I will add that, but she comes back frequently to do some maintenance on it, check the garden, and it is hers and it will be hers for as long as it possibly can be. So since returning back into the world, Natasha has gone back to school to finish her education. She has also been something of an advocate and an ambassador for PETA because she says she understands and can resonate with animals that are kept in captivity. She knows firsthand how miserable and delusional and awful it is to be kept in captivity. So she campaigns for animals who are in zoos and in cages and circuses and things like that. She's done a massive amount of traveling, which is amazing. And she has campaigned and advocated for people who have been in similar situations to herself. So that is pretty much everything from me on the Natasha Kampusch case. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative. I think this case kind of does leave you thinking about, can you ever really take enough precautions? I don't think you could get two more prepared people than Natasha and her mother. And something like this, unfortunately, did still happen to them. So I think it just goes to show it is definitely more about bad luck than anything else. But please, I would love to know your thoughts and opinions about this case. If you want to leave them in the comments, that would be great. I love reading through them. I got a fair few on my last video and it was just so nice to like see what everybody thought. And thank you so much for watching, especially if you've watched to the end. I have no idea how long this video has been at this point because I've filmed it in about 10 different clips because I had to keep going to put drops in the cat's ear. And now he hates me. You all maybe get to meet them next week. <laughs> but once again, thank you so much. Please like, comment, subscribe, interact, engage, share, whatever you want to do. Please do it. It would mean the world to me. And I will see you next week for another video. Heads up, I have already started researching it and it's a bloody good one. So you want to be here for that. But anyway, thank you so much and I will see you soon.